This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Four. The millions of laws which exist for the regulation of humanity appear upon investigation to be divided into three principal categories. Protection of property, protection of persons, protection of government. And by analyzing each of these three categories, we arrive at the same logical and necessary conclusion, the uselessness and hurtfulness of law. Socialists know what is meant by protection of property. Laws on property are not made to guarantee either to the individual or to society the enjoyment of the produce of their own labor. On the contrary, they are made to rob the producer of a part of what he has created and to secure to certain other people that portion of the produce which they have stolen either from the producer or from society as a whole. When, for example, the law establishes Mr. So-and-so's right to a house, it is not establishing his right to a cottage he has built for himself, or to a house he has erected with the help of some of his friends. In that case, no one would have disputed his right. On the contrary, the law is establishing his right to a house which is not the product of his labor. First of all, because he has had it built for him by others to whom he has not paid the full value of their work. And next, because that house represents a social value, which he could not have produced for himself. The law is establishing his right to what belongs to everybody in general, to nobody in particular. The same house built in the midst of Siberia would not have the value it possesses in a large town. And, as we know, that value arises from the labor of something like 50 generations of men who have built the town, beautified it, supplied it with water and gas, fine promenades, colleges, theaters, shops, railways, and roads leading in all directions. Thus, by recognizing the right of Mr. So-and-so to a particular house in Paris, London, or Rouen, the law is unjustly appropriating to him a certain portion of the produce of the labor of mankind in general. And it is precisely because this appropriation and all other forms of property bearing the same character are a crying injustice that a whole arsenal of laws and a whole army of soldiers, policemen, and judges are needed to maintain it against the good sense and just feeling inherent in humanity. Well, Half our laws, the civil code in each country, serves no other purpose than to maintain this appropriation, this monopoly for the benefit of certain individuals against the whole of mankind. Three-fourths of the causes decided by the tribunals are nothing but quarrels between monopolists, two robbers disputing over their booty. And a great many of our criminal laws have the same object in view, their end being to keep the workman in a subordinate position towards his employer, and thus afford security for exploitation. As for guaranteeing the product of his labor to the producer, there are no laws which even attempt such a thing. It is so simple and natural, so much a part of the manners and customs of mankind, that law has not given it so much as a thought. Open brigandage, sword in hand, is no feature of our age. Neither does one workman ever come and dispute the produce of his labor with another. If they have a misunderstanding, they settle it by calling in a third person, without having recourse to law. The only person who exacts from another what the other has produced is the proprietor, who comes in and deducts the lion's share. As for humanity in general, it everywhere respects the right of each to what he has created, without the interposition of any special laws. As all the laws about property, which make up thick volumes of codes, and are the delight of our lawyers, have no other object than to protect the unjust appropriating of human labor by certain monopolists, there is no reason for their existence, and, on the day of the revolution, Social revolutionists are thoroughly determined to put an end to them. Indeed, 
a bonfire might be made with perfect justice of all laws bearing upon the so-called rights of property, all title deeds, all registers, in a word, of all that is in any way connected with an institution which will soon be looked upon as a blot in the history of humanity, as humiliating as the slavery and serfdom of past ages. The remarks just made upon laws concerning property are quite as applicable to the second category of laws, those for the maintenance of government, i.e. constitutional law. It again is a complete arsenal of laws, decrees, ordinances, orders in council, and what not, all serving to protect the diverse forms of representative government, delegated or usurped, beneath which humanity is writhing. We know very well. Anarchists have often enough pointed out in their perpetual criticism of the various forms of government that the mission of all governments, monarchical, constitutional, or republican, is to protect and maintain by force the privileges of the classes in possession, the aristocracy, clergy, and traders. A good third of our laws and each century possesses some tens of thousands of them. The fundamental laws on taxes, excise duties, the organization of ministerial departments and their offices, of the army, the police, the church, etc., have no other end than to maintain, patch up, and develop the administrative machine. And this machine, in its turn, serves almost entirely to protect the privileges of the possessing classes. Analyze all these laws, observe them in action day by day, and you will discover that not one is worth preserving. About such laws, there can be no two opinions. Not only anarchists, but more or less revolutionary radicals also, are agreed that the only use to be made of laws concerning the organization of government is to fling them into the fire. The third category of law still remains to be considered, that relating to the protection of the person and the detection and prevention of crime. This is the most important, because most prejudices attach to it. Because, if law enjoys a certain amount of consideration, it is in consequence of the belief that this species of law is absolutely indispensable to the maintenance of security in our societies. These are laws developed from the nucleus of customs useful to human communities, which have been turned to account by rulers to sanctify their own domination. The authority of the chiefs of tribes, of rich families and towns, and of the king depended upon their judicial functions. And even down to the present day, whenever the necessity of government is spoken of, its function as supreme judge is the thing implied. Without a government, men would tear one another to pieces, argues the village orator. The ultimate end of all government is to secure twelve honest jurymen to every accused person, said Burke. Well, in spite of all the prejudices existing on this subject, it is quite time that anarchists should boldly declare this category of laws as useless and injurious as the preceding ones. First of all, as to so-called crimes, assaults upon persons, it is well known that two-thirds, and often as many as three-fourths, of such crimes are instigated by the desire to obtain possession of someone's wealth. This immense class of so-called crimes and misdemeanors will disappear on the day on which private property ceases to exist. But, it will be said, there will always be brutes who will attempt the lives of their fellow citizens, who will lay their hands to a knife in every quarrel, and revenge the slightest offense by murder if there are not laws to restrain and punishments to withhold them. This refrain is repeated every time the right of society to punish is called in question. Yet there is one fact upon this head which at the present time is thoroughly established. The severity of punishment does not diminish the amount of crime. Hang, and, if you like, quarter murderers, and the number of murders will not decrease by one. 
On the other hand, abolish the penalty of death, and there will not be one murder more. There will be fewer. Statistics prove it. But if the harvest is good, and bread cheap, and the weather fine, the number of murders immediately decreases. This again is proved by statistics. The amount of crime always augments and diminishes in proportion to the price of provisions and the states of the weather. Not that all murders are actuated by hunger, that is not the case. But when the harvest is good, and provisions are at an obtainable price, and when the sun shines, men, lighter-hearted and less miserable than usual, do not give way to gloomy passions, do not, from trivial motives, plunge a knife into the bosom of a fellow creature. Moreover, it is also a well-known fact that the fear of punishment has never stopped a single murderer. He who kills his neighbor from revenge or misery does not reason much about consequence, and there have been few murderers who were not firmly convinced that they should escape prosecution. Without speaking of a society in which a man will receive a better education, in which the development of all his faculties and the possibility of exercising them will procure him so many enjoyments that he will not seek to poison them by remorse, without speaking of the society of the future, even in our society, even with those sad products of misery whom we see today in the public houses of great cities, on the day when no punishment is inflicted upon murderers, the number of murders will not augment by a single case, and it is extremely probable that it will be, on the contrary, diminished by all those cases which are due at present to habitual criminals who have been brutalized in prison. We are continually being told of the benefits conferred by law and the beneficial effect of penalties, but have the speakers ever attempted to strike a balance between the benefits attributed to laws and penalties and the degrading effect of these penalties upon humanity? Only calculate all the evil passions awakened in mankind by the atrocious punishments formerly inflicted in our streets. Man is the cruelest animal upon earth, and who has pampered and developed the cruel instincts unknown even amongst monkeys, if it is not the king, the judge, and the priests, armed with law, who caused flesh to be torn off in strips, boiling pitch to be poured into wounds, limbs to be dislocated, bones to be crushed, men to be sawn asunder to maintain their authority. Only estimate the torrent of depravity let loose in human society by the informing, which is countenanced by judges, and paid in hard cash by governments, under pretext of assisting in the discovery of crime. Only go into the gales and study what man becomes when he is deprived of freedom and shut up with other depraved beings, steeped in the vice and corruption which oozes from the very walls of our existing prisons. Only remember that the more these prisons are reformed, the more detestable they become. Our model modern penitentiaries are a hundredfold more abominable than the dungeons of the Middle Ages. Finally, Consider what corruption, depravity of mind, is kept up amongst men by the idea of obedience, the very essence of law, of chastisement, of authority having the right to punish, to judge irrespective of our conscience and the esteem of our friends, of the necessity for executioners, gailers, and informers, in a word, by all the attributes of law and authority. Consider all this, and you will assuredly agree with us in saying that a law inflicting penalties is an abomination which should cease to exist. Peoples without political organization, and therefore less depraved than ourselves, have perfectly understood that the man who is called criminal is simply unfortunate, that the remedy is not to flog him, to chain him up, or to kill him on the scaffold or in prison but to relieve him by the most brotherly care, by treatment based on equality, by the usages of life amongst honest men. In the next revolution, we hope that this cry will go forth. Burn the guillotine, demolish the prisons, drive away the judges, policemen, and informers, 
the impurest race upon the face of the earth. Treat as a brother the man who has been led by passion to do ill to his fellow. Above all, take from the ignoble products of middle-class idleness the possibility of displaying their vices in attractive colors. And be sure that but few crimes will mar our society. The main supports of crime are idleness, law, and authority. Laws about property, about government, laws about penalties and misdemeanors, and authority, which takes upon itself to manufacture these laws and to apply them. No more laws, no more judges. Liberty, equality, and practical human sympathy are the only effectual barriers we can oppose to the antisocial instincts of certain among us. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.